All right. So uh, today uh, we start discussing a new topic, invariant and cyclic subspaces. So let me just recall that the previous time we have uh, discussed uh, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and eigenspaces, right? So in particular, recall from the last time that uh, if T is a linear operator on the vector space V, lambda an eigenvalue of T, then we define the corresponding eigenspace E lambda, yeah, the eigenspace of um, T corresponding to lambda, the eigenvalue, right? So let me say it corresponding to lambda. Uh, we define it as follows. So we take E lambda to consist of all vectors X and V such that when we apply T to X, this is the same as just multiplying X by lambda, okay? Which is the same as the null space of the linear operator T minus lambda times the identity linear operator. And uh, similarly, we have a definition of eigenspaces for a matrix, okay? Uh, so, we have one result which uh, tells us something about the dimensions of eigenspaces. So this is theorem 5.7. So again, this is not a new result yet. This is a re re reminder about the result from 115a. So we know that if T is a linear operator on V and the dimension of the space V is finite and lambda is an eigenvalue, of t, okay, and let's say it has multiplicity m, okay. So remember what multiplicity is. So recall that multiplicity m means that um, m is the largest integer such that uh, t minus lambda to the power m is a factor of uh, the characteristic polynomial, right? So of the characteristic polynomial f of t of the linear operator capital T, okay? So it means uh, the characteristic polynomial can be written as t minus lambda to the power m times some other polynomial, okay? So this is the multiplicity of a, of a given eigenvalue. And uh, this multiplicity it bounds the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace, okay? So we have that uh, the dimension of the eigenspace E lambda is between one and m, yeah? So it's at most m and uh, it's at least one. Yeah, it cannot be the zero vector space because uh, it must contain at least one eigenvector, uh, which is non-zero. Okay, so we have this uh, this bound on the dimensions of uh, eigenspaces. Okay, so now let us put eigenspaces into. Uh, we can view them as an example of a more general notion of a special subspace with respect to a given operator. So let's uh, let me define that. So assume that T uh, is a linear operator for, so a linear transformation from V to V, linear operator on V, okay? Then a subspace W of the vector space V is called a T invariant, subspace of V, okay? So we said that the subspace is T invariant if we have that T of W 
is a subset of W. Okay, so this that is we have that if um, uh, T of V belongs to W for all vectors V in um, uh, in in W. Okay. So what it means is that the subspace is closed under uh, the application of the operator T. Yeah. If I take any vector in T, let me maybe draw a picture for this. So let's say this is all of V and assume I have some subspace, let's say W. Okay. Then what we're saying is that if I pick any vector here, little V in W and I apply T to it, so T has to send it somewhere, right? A priori, it could go outside. Like it's possible that T sends V to some vector uh, T of V outside of uh, the subspace W, right? So we don't want this to happen. So then the definition of an invariant subspace guarantees that if I apply T to V, it's going to stay in W. Yeah. So T of V is going to stay in W. No matter what vector I pick in W and I apply T to it, it's still going to stay in W. Yeah. So W is closed under applications of T. That's what it means to be a T invariant subspace. All right. So we have this definition. Now let's uh, consider some examples. So let T be any linear operator on V. Okay. Then the following subspaces of V are T invariant. Okay. So no matter what you start with, we always have several invariant subspaces associated to it. So the first one is the zero space, yeah, the trivial subspace consisting of a single vector zero. Uh, so why is it T invariant? Well, remember, since T is linear, we know that for a linear map, uh, it sends zero to zero, right? So T of zero must be equal to zero by linearity. And so this means that uh, uh, if you apply T to zero, it, it remains zero. So then the subspace is fixed by T. So it is T invariant, okay? So of course, a trivial example. Similarly, the space V itself is T invariant. Right, because uh, T is a linear operator on V. So it sends vectors in V to V. So these are two trivial examples, the trivial subspace and the whole space. They're both obviously T invariant, okay? We also have that the range of T is T invariant, okay? And we also have that the null space of T is T invariant, okay? So we have these two conditions. So um, let's check, for example, for the null space. So note that let me pick any vector v in the null space of T. Okay. So v is an arbitrary vector in the null space of T. So by definition of the null space, this means that T of v is equal to zero, right? Just the, the definition of the null space. Okay. So, but then. If uh, we take W to be T of V, okay, for V some uh, uh, vector in the null space, then we have that T of W, okay, so it's going to be T of T of V, right? by definition of W, but uh, since V is in the null space, this is going to be zero, right? So this is equal to T of zero, but uh, this is of course zero again. So this is equal to zero by linearity of T. So we conclude that W also belongs to the null space of T. Okay. And so this shows that uh, the null space is T invariant. Because if I take any vector in, in, in the null space and I apply T to it, I still get a vector in the null space. Right? Okay, good. Uh, so we have this. And uh, finally, 
example five, uh, maybe the, the, the most important one is that E lambda, the eigenspace corresponding to lambda for any lambda, uh, an eigenvalue of T. Okay, so all eigenspaces of T are T invariant, are T invariant subspaces. So uh, let's check this. Okay, so um, okay, let me move this to the next page. So consider E lambda. Okay, so we have, uh, let me just copy it. So we, five E lambda is T invariant. Okay, so how to check it? Well, let's just unwind the definitions. So assume V is an eigenvector of T uh, corresponding to lambda. Okay, so by definition of eigenvector of eigenvectors, this means that uh, T of V is equal to lambda V, right? So um, we have this, right? T of V is equal to lambda V. But uh, so we have in particular that T of V, the vector T of V belongs to the span of uh, V, right? Because it's just V times some scalar. But then we have that uh, T of E lambda, right, is contained in the span of E lambda, which is just equal to E lambda because E lambda is a subspace, we already know, right? So we know that every subspace is equal to its own span. Yeah, so we get that uh, T of E lambda is, con is contained in E lambda. Okay, so simply as E lambda is a subspace of V. So this shows that uh, E lambda is closed under uh, applications of T. So it is a T invariant subspace. Okay, everyone is fine with this, with this argument. All right, so we have several examples uh, of invariant subspaces. Uh, let's consider one more. Uh, this is now uh, a more concrete example. So let T be uh, a linear operator, let's say on the vector space V, which is given by R cube, okay? And uh, we define T by uh, as follows. So T of ABC, where ABC uh, are real numbers, yeah? is equal to a plus b, b plus c, uh, zero. Okay, so consider this uh, a linear operator defined like this. Then uh, we have the following observations. Okay, so one, the xy plane, let's call it w1. So this consists of all xy, of all vectors of the form x, y, zero for x, y arbitrary real numbers, right? So this is the, pla the x, y plane in the three dimensional real space. So then this is a T invariant subspace, right? So how to check this? Well, we just have to show that uh, the subspace, uh, that the, this plane uh, is closed under application of T, okay? so. Why? Because if uh, V, let's say some vector in this plane, so V belongs to W1, then by definition, it means that uh, V is equal to AB zero, right? For some real numbers, AB in the field of scalars R, okay? But then just using the formula, the, the, that we use to define T. This means that T of V is equal to A plus B, B zero, right? And this of course is again an element of the XY plane because the third coordinate remains zero. Okay, so this shows that uh, the XY plane 
is T invariant. Uh, another subspace that is T invariant is the X axis. So the X axis, W2, let's say. So the X axis consists just of all elements of the form X, uh, zero, zero, right? Where uh, X is an arbitrary real number. So this is also T invariant. Okay. Again, we can check it just uh, using the definition of T. So V is an arbitrary vector in W2. This means that V is equal to uh, A0, 0, 0 for some real number A, right? But then applying the formula uh, that we have for T, this means that T of V is equal to A plus 0, 0 plus 0, 0 which is just a zero zero again, right? And this is of course an element of uh, of the x-axis, excuse me. Yeah, so this shows that the x-axis is also uh, T invariant, okay? But in this example, we just saw some uh, uh, invariant subspaces basically ad hoc, yeah? So uh, by hand, our task is actually to learn how to determine the invariant subspaces of a given operator. In general, yeah. So we want to understand to develop a general theory of uh, how to understand invariant subspaces of a given operator. So uh, let's begin with yet another special kind of uh, subspaces definition. Okay, so let T be a linear operator on V. Okay, and let X in V be a non-zero vector. So X is not equal to zero, okay? Then the subspace W, which we define to be the span of uh, the set consisting of X, T of X, T square of X, etc. okay? For, so we, we keep applying T uh, again and again, and then we take the span of the resulting set. So this subspace is called the T cyclic subspace of V generated by the vector X. So what is the idea of this definition? The idea is that we are trying to find the smallest T invariant subspace of V containing X. So let's make this precise. So remark, uh, the T cyclic subspace of V generated by X, it is the smallest, and I put it in quotation marks for a second before we make it precise. So it is the smallest, T invariant subspace of V containing X. Okay. So what do we mean by this? That is any T invariant subspace of V containing X must also contain W. Okay, so this is one, what we mean by the smallest. So the smallest with respect to inclusion. Okay, so let's check that this is indeed the case. So indeed, if uh, let's say Z contained in V, is a T invariant subspace of V and X belongs to Z, okay? Then by T invariance, we also have that T of X belongs to Z, 
right? Because again, remember the picture. So I have V, I have some Z, uh, a subspace, right? Which is T invariant. And X is in T, in Z, excuse me. So then applying T to X means that it is still in Z, right? Okay. But since uh, T of X is a vector in Z and Z is T invariant, then we also have that T of T of X, which is just T square of X, is also in Z, right? But then we can repeat it because now I have a vector T square of X in Z and Z is T invariant. So then I have T uh, cube of X is in Z, etc. So we get that Tn of Z, uh, of X, excuse me, is in Z for all N, right? Okay, so it means that the set consisting of uh, x, t of x, t square of x, etc., is a subset of z. Okay, and since z is a subspace of v, we also have that W, which is the span of this set, so the span of X, T of X, T square of X, etc., is a subset of Z, right? Okay, so this concludes the argument. Uh, let me see there's some question in, in the chat. Is W the T cyclic subspace of V? Yes, yes. So we define, uh, Throughout this page, uh, W is the here. Here's we take a W to be the cyclic subspace. Uh, is this set infinite? Yeah, good question. So uh, it depends. It can be fine. It can be infinite. We don't know a priori. So, for example, look. Uh, let's go back for a second to the zero vector space. Yeah. So it just has one element. But if I take zero. Uh, then I can look at t of zero, which is again zero, right? But then I can look at t of t of zero, so t square of zero is going to be zero again, etc. So even though we apply the linear operator infinitely many times, again and again, we never get any different vectors. We only get the same vector zero. So in this case, the vector is uh, th this whole set is finite, consists just of a single element zero. On the other hand, uh, in some other examples, we will see it can be infinite as well. Yeah. So you don't know in advance. It can be fine. It can be infinite. A priori, n never stops. But we will investigate the question of when we can actually bound uh, this n. Uh, this will be something we will consider. But for now, yeah, we don't know. For now, you just have to apply it infinitely many times. Again and again to get the full set. All right. So yeah, OK. So that, uh, so that concludes the argument. So we have shown that. Uh, since z, we started with with, uh, with a z which was an arbitrary t invariant subspace of v containing x, and we have concluded that it contains w, the span of this set. Sometimes the set is called the orbit of x with respect to t. Okay, so let me record it. So this set x, t of x, t square of x, etc. Sometimes we refer to it as the orbit of X with respect to T. And why do I call it orbit? Well, because you can think about it like, you know, you start with X, then you apply T to it, you get a T of X, then you apply T square of X, you get um, some other vector, yeah? And you can keep going. It's possible that it returns back to X. It's possible that it keeps on going on forever. All right. So the idea that somehow we think about it as an orbit with respect to the action of T on vectors. Okay. So it's just a piece of terminology. Uh, let's see. So let's uh, consider an example of this. So example three, an example of cyclic subspaces. So uh, let T be a linear operator on the space R cube again, okay? Defined as follows. 
So we define it by the formula T of A, B, C is equal to minus B plus C, A plus C, uh, 3C. Okay, so not, nothing special about this operator here, just, just a random example, but just to see how one can check some, uh, some of these uh, objects in the, in the particular example. So let's determine the cyclic subspace. So we determine the cyclic subspace, uh, well, T cyclic more precisely, yeah. When, uh, sometimes I might just say cyclic if we, if we have a given uh, a linear operator in the background, yeah? But it's better to always say T-cyclic uh, and refers explicitly to what operator we are talking about. So T-cyclic uh, sub, 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 excuse me, need to, uh, so T-cyclic subspace uh, of R3, yeah, generated by uh, let's say the vector e1 in the standard basis so one zero zero okay well so let's just apply the definition so first we need to calculate t of e1 so this is t of one zero zero right so i just apply the formula to these numbers and we get that this is the vector zero one zero okay which is just e2 in the standard basis Okay, now we need to calculate T square of E1, which is going to be uh, T of T of E1. This is just T of E2, as we, as we just determined, right? So now apply the formula again. What we get is that this is minus one, zero, zero. So this is minus E1, okay? Well, uh, let's do one more. So we have T3 of e1 so it's just going to be t of uh, t of t of e1 right so this is just t of minus e1 by linearity this is minus t of e1 and uh, if you plug in the numbers well we don't even need to plug in the numbers even right because we know t of e1 is e2 so we get minus e2 here okay and finally t4 of E1 is going to be T of T3, T cube, sorry, of E1, which is the same as T of minus E2, which is minus T of E2. And this is equal to E1, okay? And so note, now we went, uh, we started with E1 and in four iterations, we got back to E1, okay? So we got an orbit of length four. Um, okay, so here we did it by hand, right? So the conclusion is then, that uh, T N of E1 for any N belongs to one of these four values. E2 minus E1 minus E2, E1 for all natural numbers N, right? Because once we go back to E1, we are just going to loop, right? Because now I have a one here. So then again, I have to, then T5 is going to be just T of E1 again, which is E2, et cetera. Okay, so we have uh, determined this. And uh, hence, we have that the span of the set E1, T of E1, T square of E1, et cetera, right? This is just the span of the linearly independent vectors in the set. So here we have E2 and E1, right? And then we have minus E1, minus E2, but they don't add anything because they're just uh, the scalar multiples of E1 and E2. So this is the same as the span of E1, E2, right? So this is just uh, the X, Y axis. So this is a set of all vectors of the form ST0 for ST arbitrary real numbers, okay? So this way we can uh, describe the cyclic subspace generated by E1 uh, explicitly, okay? But of course you see here, we only needed four iterations. Uh, in advance, you don't know how many it will take. You might have to calculate thousand iterations, etc. So uh, for simple operators, uh, 
it's often possible to, to calculate the cyclic subspace by hand, but in general, we need uh, to develop some theory to actually be able to, uh, to, 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 to calculate, to determine cyclic subspaces, okay? So that's what we are going to, uh, to, to, to discuss. So uh, first of all, let's begin with the definition here. Uh, a helpful definition of a restriction of a linear operator. So assume that T is a linear operator uh, on a vector space V and assume that W is a T invariant subspace of V. Okay, so I have a T invariant subspace of V. Then we can consider the map which we denote as T subscript W and it's going to be a map from W to W and we call this map the restriction of T to W. Okay. And uh, this map is defined by uh, simply applying T. So TW of X is equal to t of x for all x in w okay so we don't change anything we just uh, apply t so note that this is indeed a map from w to w and not just from w to v as t was originally right uh, because we have that by t invariance t of x belongs to w for all x in W, because W is T invariant. So this is what makes uh, this definition well-defined uh, as a map from W to W. Okay. And then what we have is that TW is a linear operator on W. Okay, so this should be straightforward simply because we define TW using T and T was linear, right? So and then in the same way, we get that TW is linear as well. Okay, everyone is fine with this definition. So the idea is simply that when we have a, a linear, sorry, when we have a T invariant subspace, we can forget about the ambient space V and just restrict the situation to the smaller subspace W. And we can study how T acts on this smaller subspace in its own right, okay? So the idea is that maybe we can split, when we're trying to understand T on a big space, we can restrict to some smaller chunks and understand T on each of them separately, and then get a global picture out of it. So that's, that's the motivation for this. Okay, so let's understand some of the properties of this uh, linear operator, the restriction of T to an invariant subspace. So uh, TW inherits some properties from its uh, parent operator T. So the important property is the theorem 521. Okay, so assume that T is a linear operator on the vector space V, finite dimensional, okay? And we let W be a T invariant subspace of V, okay? Then uh, the characteristic polynomial of TW divides the characteristic polynomial of T. Okay, so this is the first uh, important fact. The characteristic polynomial of the restriction of our operator to an invariant subspa uh, subspace uh, divides the characteristic polynomial of T itself. Okay, so let's check this proof. Uh, so first of all, to, 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 to consider uh, uh, the characteristic polynomial, we need to fix a basis as usual, right? 
So let uh, gamma, let's say uh, given by V1, V2, etc., all the way through VK be an ordered basis for the subspace W. Okay, so we first pick a basis for W and then we extend it to an ordered basis for V. So we know that every, it's always possible to extend, right? So we extend uh, it to an ordered basis, beta, which we write as V1 through VK, yeah? So these are all the vectors from gamma, and then we have to add some vectors potentially. So we have VK plus one through VN. So this is going to be a, a basis for the whole space V, okay? So we let N be the dimension of V. All right. So now let's consider A to be the matrix representation of T with respect to beta, okay? And we let uh, B1 be the matrix representing the restriction, the linear operator TW with respect to gamma, a basis for W. Okay, so we define these matrices. Let's understand how they look like, yeah? So then we have the following. So we can write A by definition. Uh, the columns correspond to the coordinate vectors of a T applied to the vectors in the basis, right? So the first column is given by the coordinate vector of T of V1 with respect to beta. The second column is given by uh, the coordinate vector of T of V2 with respect to beta, et cetera, right? So all the way to, uh, okay, let, uh, let, let, let me spell it out, yeah, because we, we actually careful about the case position. So we have T of VK with respect to beta. Then we have the column corresponding to the coordinate vector of T of VK plus one with respect to beta, okay, etc. And we have the last one T of VN with respect to beta, okay. So I just wrote out the matrix representation uh, of T with respect to the basis beta, okay? All right, so now, because uh, we know that W is a T invariant subspace, okay, of V, we have that T of VI is in W, for i ranging from one to k, okay? Because remember, uh, the vectors v1 through vk, they are all in w, right? This is a basis for w. So applying t to them stays in w by t invariance. For the first k, for, the, for what comes after, we don't know. We're not saying anything, okay? But then by the choice, of beta and gamma, we have that for every vector x in W, the coordinate vector of x with respect to beta is given by uh, the column vector, which uh, where we have uh, the vector coordinate, coordinate vector of x with respect to gamma, because it's in W, right? followed by zeros, okay, followed by a bunch of zeros, where which position does it change, right? So here we have the first K coordinates here are given by the uh, coordinates of X with respect to gamma. And for the remaining ones, so N minus K, we have zeros, okay? So you agree with me here, simply because uh, gamma was a basis, right, for, for W. So it means we can, since X is in W, we can represent it uh, using the first K vectors of the basis and the rest is zeros, okay? So we have this. 
But uh, since we know this, then in particular, we have that T of VI. So if we look at the coordinate vector T of VI with respect to beta, it's going to be of the same form. So it's going to be the coordinate vector T of VI with respect to gamma followed by a bunch of zeros. Again, so we have the first k entries, and after that we have n minus k zeros, right? So we have this for all i between one and k. Okay. So we have this for the first uh, for for the first k vectors and the bases, okay? But then this means that we can write the matrix A. So re remember, this is A. So now I'm just substituting. Uh, what we have learned about the first k columns. So we get that A can be written as a matrix with four blocks. So we have B1 here, we have B2 here, we have B3 here, and we have zero matrix here, where this is the first k columns. This is the remaining n minus k columns. And vertically, we have the, this is the first k rows, and this is the remaining n minus k rows. Okay, so we have that A must be of this form for some matrices B2, which is a k by uh, n minus k matrix, uh, k times uh, n minus k over F and B3 correspondingly is some uh, N minus K by N minus K matrix over F, right? Okay, so we have this. Uh, and uh, excuse me, give me one second. I need to uh, connect uh, the power cord for my laptop. All right, uh, so I'm back. Uh, okay, so are you with me so far? So we have this presentation of the matrix A now. Because for the first K columns, we have uh, determined that we must have zeros in the, uh, in the bottom, right? In the bottom and minus K positions. Okay, everyone is fine so far? Okay. So, uh, so we have the phase of this form, all right? So now we uh, calculate the characteristic polynomial of, of T and of T of W as well. So I'm going to the new page. So let us denote by F of T, the characteristic polynomial of T and by G of T, the characteristic polynomial of TW, okay? But then we have uh, that F of T by definition is equal to the determinant of A minus T I N, right? So this is just the definition of the characteristic polynomial. This is the same uh, as the determinant Okay, so now we use that A has this special form. So this is the determinant of the matrix in four blocks, B1 minus T I K, uh, B2, zero, and B3 minus T I N minus K, right? So you just, I just plug in the special shape for A that we have obtained on the previous page into the calculation of this determinant, okay? But now by the properties of determinants, 
uh, for block matrices of this form. So note that, uh, yeah, we know that we can write this determinant, in fact, as a product of G of T, where note that uh, G of T is, corresponds to this. Yeah, so we have G of T times the determinant of B3 minus T uh, I N minus K, right? Because for such for a block matrix of this form, the determinant is given by the product of the determinants of uh, these two blocks. And uh, the determinant of the first block is exactly the uh, characteristic polynomial of TW. Because B, remember, B1 was a matrix representing TW, right? And here we have uh, the determinant of the block in the lower right corner, OK? But this is exactly what we wanted, because uh, th this determinant here, it is a polynomial. Remember, determinant of, uh, of this form is a polynomial. So we have written f of t as a product of g of t and some polynomial. So it's exactly what we wanted. So g of t uh, divides f of t. This was exactly the claim. All right. So we have established um, that the restriction of linear operator uh, is characteristic polynomial divides the characteristic polynomial of the original operator. Uh, so let's just consider an example of this. I think it's example five in the um, in our enumeration. Yeah. So let T be uh, the linear operator on uh, let's say V, which we take to be R4, given by T of A, B, C, D is equal, uh, and again, it's a random example, yeah? So nothing special about it, but I just want to, to, to illustrate this notion in this special, uh, more concrete example, uh, which you might need uh, for, for various calculations in the homework, et cetera. So let's define it by the following formula. So this, this, uh, 2C minus D, C plus D, okay? So assume you are given some linear operator defined by some formula like this. And uh, consider W a subspace, uh, the X, Y axis. So it consists of all TS 0, 0, uh, where TS are arbitrary real numbers, okay? So then we have the following uh, observations. So the first one is that this subspace W is T invariant. Okay, so how to verify this? Uh, for any uh, vector in W, which is of the form AB00 in W for some B and for some A and B, excuse me. Uh, we have just applying this formula for T, we would get that T of a b zero zero is equal to a plus b b zero zero which is again an element of w right so this shows that um that uh, w is indeed t invariant so now let's try to uh understand the characteristic polynomials of t and its restriction to w so let gamma be the standard basis so e1 e2 okay this is ordered basis for W, just like we did in the proof of the theorem. So we extend it to uh, the standard basis for R4. Let's call it beta. So it consists of E1, E2, E3, E4. A basis for uh, R4, yeah? Okay. Let's calculate the matrices that appear in the, in the proof we just gave. So B1, which we define to be the matrix representing TW with respect to gamma. If we calculate it in this case, it's going to be one, one, zero, one. Okay, so you know how to calculate such things. And uh, A, so the matrix representing beta, we denoted it in the proof, right? So this is going to be uh, a bigger matrix, yeah, four by four matrix. So let me write it out and uh, you should check uh, the calculation. 
yourself uh, to make sure yeah uh, minus one one minus one one okay so we get some four by four matrix doesn't matter what it is so uh, then we consider the characteristic polynomial of t okay characteristic polynomial of t uh, by definition this is the determinant of a minus t i4 right because we have four by four matrices now we just plug in all the data so this is going to be the determinant of one minus t zero 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 uh, one one minus t zero zero two zero uh, one minus t one and minus one one minus one one minus t okay so this is just a calculation uh plugging in the formula using uh, the expression for a now as in the proof we can split it because you see it's a block matrix so we can sp uh, split it into the product the determinant of the upper left block so the determinant of minus uh, one minus t zero one one minus t times the determinant of uh two minus t minus one 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 minus t right and uh, okay this we of course know how to calculate so then we get uh g of t times the determinant of this matrix there two minus t one minus one one minus t okay so this g is the characteristic polynomial of uh of tw okay and i leave it to you to actually write out this polynomial explicitly okay so it's just an illustration for the same process we did in the proof abstractly here it's an illustration for some concrete example uh, how to do the same thing like with actually with, with some particular numerical uh, values or give particular vector space okay okay so let me stop here we'll explore further properties of uh, invariant and cyclic subspaces uh, next time okay but i'll stop here today so thanks everyone for your attention all right okay yeah so thanks everyone and uh, i'll see you